Welcome. Colleagues, students, community members, co-conspirators. Hi, I'm Todd Little Siebold. I teach history and Latin American studies here uh, at the College of the Atlantic. I've had 13 years of teaching at this extraordinary institution. And for me, this is uh, fun to have a conference like this to see the kinds of ideas that have come together over the last several days. It's striking to me um, in a place which is normally, for a professor, a very inspiring place to be, to be surrounded then by an even more inspiring uh, company of the last several days. The people from not-for-profits, from farming groups, from uh, educational institutions, from our transatlantic partners, our friends from Mexico, to see our students interacting with um, them, and it's been truly inspiring for me. There's been a great deal of enthusiasm, constructive th thinking, and hard-headed strategizing. Um, conversations across disciplinary boundaries, national borders, and um, disparate interests that have been deeply engaging. Marion Nestle is our speaker tonight, and I can think of perhaps no better person to continue to inspire us and to engage us, particularly in the greater task of political change that will be required for creating a sustainable food system. I have to say that um, I was asked to do this and sat down uh, earlier today to write the um, introduction, and I printed out a Marion's CV. And when it came out of the printer, I just laughed because it kept coming out and coming out and coming out. <laughs> and it's um, almost, um, my colleagues will know this is meant to be funny, but it left me speechless. Um, it's hard to synthesize it, but I would say, essentially, from my perspective, looking at her CV, um, she has an extraordinary um, record of public service. Public service that stretches across um, many decades, ranges from government service to uh, teaching uh, in a variety of institutions. She's currently teaching at NYU um, in the School of Nutrition, Food Studies, and public health as the Paulette Goddard professor there. But um, she is, in my estimation, maybe um, a very rare kind of person uh, in American academia, in particular uh, in the 21st century. She is a public intellectual committed to changing the hearts and minds of people beyond her classroom, beyond her institution, beyond perhaps even her country. I mean, many of her books here that you'll see have been published all over the world. Um, so I was trying to think about a way to really introduce her, and I asked several people um, how to introduce her, and Suzanne Moore suggested the following. She said, um, Marion is a force to be reckoned with. That she's been in rooms, watched her, um, where uh, regulators and food industry advocates realize that they cannot ignore this voice. And for that, we have to thank her, because she's done tremendous work. And I think we can all be, uh, we'll, we will be inspired by her continued, continued work and by her talk tonight. So without further ado, I'll introduce the main act. Thank you, Todd, for that incredibly embarrassing introduction. Um, my explanation for my work is something that probably those of you at this college won't understand, but I've got tenure. <laughs> oh. um, I have to say, this is just an incredible experience for me. It's very unusual in my experience to talk to a group of people who have been thinking as long and hard about these issues as you have and as seriously about it. So. Um, this is going to be a new experience for me. I'm usually talking to people who are not exactly sold on these ideas and find these ideas very hard to digest, if that's the right word. 
So I hope you'll forgive me if I sound a little hesitant about all of this. I just don't know how you're going to respond. <laughs> um, let me start by uh, saying that I think we're in the middle of a food revolution, and you're right at the forefront of it. When Time Magazine has an article about the Nyman Ranch, and you know, Time Magazine is kind of right wing, or at least it represents uh, corporate America, and then The Nation, a week later, has a uh, an issue on how, to, how the food revolution is growing democracy. I think that says it all. I mean, this is really on the public agenda in a way that it has never, that I've never seen it before. Uh, my own work deals with food systems, uh, from production to consumption. And by that, I mean the interaction between agriculture, food, nutrition, and public health. And the two aspects of public health that I've been most interested in are obesity and food safety. And these don't seem like they're necessarily related, but you can't ask people to eat healthier food if that food gives them E. coli or salmonella and they get really sick or die. So they are, in fact, very closely related, in part because the forces that are behind the issues around uh, obesity and food safety are really quite similar. And I'm going to say a little, uh, I'm going to say something about both of them today. My starting point always is public confusion about what it is that they're supposed to be eating. Uh, the public is demonstrably confused. Some of it has to do with the research. Some of it has to do with media. Some of it has to do uh, with just confusion in the marketplace. But I think the confusion is really unfortunate because you don't need to be a genius to figure out what it is you're supposed to be eating. In fact, it's so simple I can summarize it on one slide. Um, and I have to say, Michael Pollan, who's a much better writer than I am, did this in seven words, and it took me 15. But um, the, the, uh, uh, my mantra is eat less, move more, eat plenty of fresh uh, fruits and vegetables. They don't have to be fresh. Uh, fruits, vegetables, and whole grain. Don't eat too much junk food. Some junk food's OK. Just don't eat too much of it. Enjoy what you're eating, and please don't eat my book. Um, if it seems more complicated than that, it's surely because of the effect of this kind of advice on the food industry. And this was beautifully expressed by an executive of Coca-Cola a couple of years ago who gave an interview with Advertising Age in which she said this astounding thing about obesity. It's our Achilles heel. We never used to have to worry about obesity, and now it just absolutely dominates every discussion we have. It's a huge, huge issue. So it's not only a huge issue for people who might be gaining weight, it's also a huge issue for the food industry. And the reason for that has to do with the fact that obesity is not a necessarily, it's not only a cosmetic problem, it's not a cosmetic problem. It raises the risk for chronic disease. And I want to make it really clear that not everyone who is overweight is going to get type 2 diabetes. In fact, the percentage of type 2 diabetes, um, even among people who are overweight, is really quite small. But it is going up in parallel with rising rates of obesity. And the big concern, of course, is that it's going to affect children, because children with type 2 diabetes will have a lifetime of medical treatment. And we don't exactly have a consumer-friendly healthcare system in this country. So this is a big problem for society. So if obesity is a problem, um, what are we going to do about it? And there are two approaches to dealing with it. The first is the personal responsibility <laughs> approach, beautifully expressed by The Economist, um, with a statement that you know I just thought was amazing. If people want to eat their way to grossness in an early grave, let them. If they're fat, it's their fault. And it, as a public health professional, if I believe that personal responsibility is responsible for the way people eat, the remedy is very simple. All I have to do is teach people what's healthy for them, and they'll do it, right? Um, they won't do it, unfortunately, as any of you have tried nutrition education uh, will probably know. And the reason for that has to do with the fact that we live in what the New York Times called a gorge yourself environment, an environment in which there's too much food, too many choices, and too much eating. And here, as a public health professional, the remedy is to change society. To change society in order to make it easier to for people to make more healthful choices. And that, I think, is what we're about. Okay, 
If we're going to change society, the question is, what is it about society that needs to change? Uh, you may be able to think of a few things, um, but let's just talk about obesity here. And um, if we want to talk about changing society, we have to talk about the way that society changed. Um, people didn't always used to be uh, overweight and fat at the levels that they are now, in fact. For decades and decades and decades, up until the early 1980s, weights, the percentage of overweight people in America stayed about the same. It was about 15%. Starting in the early 1980s, it began, the percentages started to go up and they went up quite dramatically. So the obvious question is, what happened in the early 1980s that either made people eat more or move less? Um, I'm not going to be talking about the moving less part of this, because, even though I think that activity is really important, because there's very little evidence that people are less active now than they were in the early 1980s. But there is an enormous amount of evidence that people are eating more. So the question then becomes, why are people eating, why did people start eating more in the early 1980s? And I think there are three reasons, or at least there are actually lots of reasons, but I think there are three main ones. The first one is always to blame moms. Um, it's, all, I mean, it's a useful thing to do when you don't know what else to do. Um, the idea is that women started going back into the workforce, thereby creating an enormous demand for convenience. But if you look at the actual data on this, women started going back into the workforce in the early uh, 1950s. Uh, by 1980, which is when all this started, um, the, the, a large proportion of women were already back. This may be part of the explanation, but it's certainly not the whole explanation. Um, a more important one, I think, is agricultural policy. And this is the way in which agriculture and nutrition are related. Um, farm policy changed in the 1970s in a switch from paying farmers to restrict the amount of food they grew to paying farmers to grow as much food as they possibly could, some farmers. And the result of that was mountains of corn in a sea of farm subsidies that no administration, Democrat or Republican, has been able to get rid of. Um, what that did was to increase the number of calories available in the food supply. Uh, and what you see here in that pink band that goes across the, um, across the slide is an, the average number of calories that were available in the food supply per capita, man, woman, and child, was about 3,200 per capita per day uh, for decades and decades and decades, almost 100 years since the Department of Agriculture first started measuring this. Uh, starting in the early 1980s, that shifted and went up. As farmers were producing more food, uh, the number of calories available in the food supply, and this isn't what people are eating necessarily. This is what's available, less exports plus imports, went from 3,200 a day to the present 4,000 calories a day available, which is roughly twice average need. Even with the amount of calories that the Department of Agriculture says is wasted, it's still far more than anybody needs. We're talking men, women, little tiny babies here. And so what this did was make the food industry enormously competitive. If you're a food company trying to sell a food product in this kind of environment, you're trying to push your product into a food environment in which there's twice as many calories as anybody needs. So you're very competitive. But that wasn't all that happened. Starting in the early 1980s, we had the advent of what is called the shareholder value movement, which was attributed to Jack Welch, who was um, then the head of General Electric. And he gave a speech in 1981 in which he said, enough of this blue chip stock stuff. That is, stocks that gave very, very long term, slow but steady returns on investment. As investors, we want higher returns on investment right now. And the result of that was that Wall Street changed the way that it evaluated companies, all companies, and we're seeing the results of that in, um, on Wall Street right now. But for food companies, it was a particularly difficult situation because they were already trying to sell their food products and make money in an environment in which there was an enormous overabundance of food. Now they not only had to make a profit, but they had to grow their profits every 90 days. And the result of that was that companies changed society. In order to find outlets for selling more food, they changed society in ways that nobody even noticed. 
Uh, and I'm, the for the next sl several slides, I'm going to go through some of the ways in which society changed since the early 1980s. Every time you see an exclamation point, that shorthand for if you're doing that, you're going to be eating more calories than you would if you were eating at home. So food outside the home. Because there was such an abundance of food, the price went down, people ate out more. Uh, if you eat in a restaurant, you're going to eat more food than you would if you were serving yourself at home. I ate a salad at a restaurant in Bar Harbor this afternoon that I thought would have served four easily. Um, at least that's, I didn't eat all of it, but I thought it would have served four. Larger portions, uh, and that was exactly what that was about. This is my former doctoral student, now Dr. Lisa Young, and her thesis defense in which she, um, her thesis was about measuring the size of portions in the food supply. The white cup on the, on the left is a Department of Agriculture standard serving size for soft drink. It holds eight ounces and, and that's 100 calories. The one on the right is a double gulp that holds 64 ounces, 800 calories. And the evidence shows that that cup, that large cup, is not passed down the aisle in the movie theater and shared among everyone who's sitting there. <laughs> it's um, consumed by one person. It's very interesting. I wrote something on my blog, uh, foodpolitics.com, yesterday about soft drinks and said that they ought to label these things with 800 calories. And somebody wrote in and said, you're being really misleading. Nobody eats 800, nobody drinks 800 calories worth of soft drinks at a time. This person may not, but people do. I don't. You might. Um, on the portion size, one of the things about the business with portion size is if there is one thing that I could teach America, it would be that larger portions have more calories. Um, let me tell you, it's not intuitively obvious. And that was proven by Brian Wansink, who's a very clever professor at Cornell. And what I'm showing here is his famous Super Bowl experiment in which he invited his own students who should have known better to come to his house and watch the Super Bowl with him, one of America's big eating occasions. And he put half of them in one room with two quart bowls of popcorn and the other half in another room with four quart bowls of popcorn. At the end, he counted up the number of calories from popcorn that they had eaten and discovered to no, no, but not to his surprise that the ones with the four quart bowls had eaten um, almost twice as many calories as the ones with the two quart bowls. And when he asked them how many calories they had eaten, they underestimated the number of calories they were eating by a much greater extent. It is not intuitively obvious that uh, Larger portions have more calories. Large portions encourage people to eat more calories and to underestimate uh, the amount of calories that they're eating. You don't need another explanation for gaining weight. Ubiquity is another I like to ask the question, when did it become OK to eat in bookstores? I promise you that prior to the mid-1980s, you could not bring a food into a bookstore. Uh, and now every bookstore has a cafe in it, and maybe your library does too. Um, proximity is another one, and one of the reasons why nutritionists like me are so upset about vending machines in schools is that the research shows that the more vending machines you have, the more products kids buy from them. And if you want to do something about school lunches, one of the first things you have to do is get rid of the vending machines. Um, the, the last one is the cheap food. And Adam Dronowski and his colleagues in Seattle have done uh, really terrific work showing how many calories a dollar can buy. And uh, this graphic shows that with one dollar, you can buy 1,200 calories worth of potato chips or 170 calories of fresh fruit, which is another way of looking at the higher cost of fruits and vegetables relative to the cost of junk food. Um, so, and these pricing strategies have a great deal to do with our agricultural policy, as many of you have been talking about today. So these are the kinds of things that Michelle Simon talked about in her terrific book, Appetite for Profit, which if you don't know about it, I think you'll be really, really interested to see it, in which, um, which is kind of a manual about how to fight the food industry. 
And she talks about the pressures on food companies from advocates, from regulators who are dying to regulate them, from lawyers who are dying to sue them, and from Wall Street that simply wants them to make more money every 90 days. And food companies reacted by going through all the stages of death and denial. Um, they did nothing, they denied, then they began fighting back. And I'm not going to say very much about the fighting back. You can go on my website, I post all their letters. Um, but they lobby government to be exempt from laws. They attack advocates. That's what those letters are about. They blame physical activity for the problem, blame personal choice. I'm not going to discuss those. What I am going to talk about is the way in which they're changing products. Um, and I want to talk specifically about health claims, functional foods, and self-endorsements, which are big, all three of which are big issues right now. First of all, health claims. We didn't have health claims on food products until 1990. Uh, the Nutrition Labeling Act that put the nutrition facts label on food products made food companies scream to Congress that this was unfair. If they had to say what was bad about their products, Congress should let them say what was good about their products. Um, so that Congress agreed and for the first time forced the FDA to begin allowing health claims. Um, and the FDA said it would, it would permit health claims that had a, a reasonable amount of scientific substantiation. And the serials that I've shown here um, have, are health claims that were proved by the FDA because there was some science behind them so that the oats and Cheerios may reduce the risk of heart disease. I thought, you know, Never mind. Oatmeal may help <laughs> reduce cholesterol, and this soy energy cereal uh, may reduce the risk of heart disease and some cancers. If you just think of it for a second, um, you know that if eating Cheerios isn't going to do very much for you, but never mind. Um, over the years, since, since the early 1990s when health claims were allowed, companies that were turned down by the FDA for health claims took the FDA to court, and the courts generally ruled in favor of the companies on the grounds of the First Amendment and freedom of speech, and the FDA gave up. Um, under the Bush administration, gave up regulating health claims. And the result is a, uh, just a complete cacophony of health claims in the supermarket. I'm going to be showing you a lot of cereal boxes, uh, not because I love cereal so much, but because the cereal companies are right at the cutting edge of marketing. And if you want to know what's going on with food marketing, you go to the cereal aisle first. So here's a Kellogg cereal with six different kinds of health claims on it. It's got little tokens that talk about the nutritional value. It'll make you smart. It'll make your heart healthy. It has zero grams of trans fat. I'm so relieved. Um, <laughs> it will lower both your blood pressure and cholesterol. And it has an endorsement from the American Heart Association, uh, despite the fact that sugars appear nine times in the ingredient list. Um, now, the American Heart Association only cares about fat and cholesterol, doesn't care about sugar. Um, so I don't think the American Heart Association should be doing this, but they get paid for it. Uh, so that's their decision. Um, th the next issue I want to talk about is the functional food business, because this is the hot new area in food marketing. Um, and a functional food is something that has something added to it over and above its basic nutritional value. And vitamin water is kind of the best example of that. This is water and sugar and whatever else the company was brilliant enough to put into it. Um, I met the person who was the originator of vitamin water. He was totally sincere in thinking that he was going to help improve the health of Americans with this. Um, and I'm sure he was really happy when he was bought out by Coca-Cola, which now owns this. Um, but functional foods, this is, the, this is where marketing is going. And it's the only thing besides organics that are selling. Uh, processed foods. Now, in um, 2008, omega-3 fats were put into absolutely everything. Um, they were put into milk and peanut butter and mayonnaise and Oreo-type cookies. Um, but omega-3s were so 2008. We are now in 2009 um, when we're talking about calcium and vitamin D. And then this astonishing Cocoa Krispies with a two-inch high immunity banner across it because it's got some vitamins in it. Um, and you'll start seeing these on cereal boxes more and more. I was fascinated by the, an, an ad for Juicy Juice, which is a 
um, a sweetened juice drink. It isn't even juice, it's a juice drink. Clearly meant for toddlers, because it's got a sippy cup, right? And it's got omega-3s in one of them, and it says right on the front of it, brain development. Uh, and on the other one, it's immunity. So if you give this sweetened juice drink to your toddler, your toddler's gonna be smarter, uh, right? Um, so this whole thing raises what I think is a really important philosophical question, and it's one that my nutritionist colleagues debate all the time, which is, is a better for you product, that is a product that has some added nutrient or something like that in it, really a good choice? When what you really want is you really want kids eating fruits and vegetables. So that brings me to the whole question of marketing to children, because you can argue that adults are adults, and one of the really great things about being an adult is you get to eat anything you want, anytime you want it, so there. Uh, but with kids, it's different, and the Institute of Medicine in December 2005 did this really big study um, on food marketing to children and youth in which they looked at 120 or more, 123 studies on the effects of marketing on kids. And they also examined the research enterprise that's devoted to teaching companies how to market to kids, the methods that are used to sell kids foods, the amount of money that's spent to market to kids and so forth and so on. Um, and they came up with all of the conclusions that you would guess marketing works and it works really, really well. And here's some of the, the how much money is spent on marketing to kids is a big debate. Um, some books have said that it's seven or eight billion dollars a year. Um, the Federal Trade Commission last year said it was only two billion dollars a year. I don't know, I, those numbers are too big for me to understand anyway. Um, and it's very hard to get these kinds of figures for individual products, but advertising age uh, has an issue once a year in which it breaks out some products. And Kellogg spent $66.1 million in 2008 just on media advertising that went through advertising agencies just on Frosted Flakes. 19 million for Pop-Tarts and nearly 11 million for um, Fruit Loops. Any nationally advertised uh, cereal has a budget at that level behind it. Um, and you know, if you compare that to what the federal government spends on nutrition education, we're not even in the same stratosphere here. Now, why would companies want to spend that extraordinary amount of money on marketing to kids who don't have much money of their own? There are three reasons. The first is brand loyalty. The idea is if you get your kid hooked on Coke early in life, that child will never drink Pepsi, even though tests have shown that nobody can tell the difference. You think you can. But if bl in blind tests, nobody can tell the difference. The second one um, is the pester factor. And you know what? You have an intuitive feel for what that is. All you have to do is watch a two-year-old in a supermarket. Um, and that's what it's called in the marketing to kids industry. The object of the game is not only to get kids to ask their parents to buy the product, but also for them to do it intelligently and give reasons for why they want to, you know, good reasons for doing it. And that brings me to the third issue, which is the one that really troubles me uh, a lot. And that is the whole point of, ki of marketing to kids is to get kids to think that they're supposed to eat kids' food. They're supposed to eat food that's made for them in packages with cartoons on them, uh, in funny shapes and colors, unidentified food objects. They're supposed to eat kids' food. And whenever I hear an adult say, gee, we can't feed kids healthy food because the kids won't eat it, I know that we're seeing food marketing to kids, aimed at kids' food, in action, and I can see how effective it is. So let me uh, go on to the third one, which is the self-endorsement. Starting about five or six years ago, companies like PepsiCo began putting these little green spots on products to identify which of their products were the healthiest. And the way this worked is really very clever. The way this worked was the companies set up their own nutritional criteria and then applied those criteria to their own products. <laughs> Um, and by some astonishing miracle, hundreds of their products qualified. Um, and the, uh, this is the better for you theory. This is the, if you asked uh, PepsiCo executives, as I did, you're marketing these things as health foods. They said, no, 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 you're being cynical. We're just marketing them as better 
for you options. Um, remember, a better for you choice is not necessarily a good choice. Now, PepsiCo wasn't the only company that did that. All of the big companies did that. Here is a craft sensible solution marked product, uh, a Lunchable. And what this means is that this is a better for you choice than other Lunchables. Uh, even though it's got a full ounce of sugar and of sugars and meats um, and already is 25% of the day's allotment of sodium and of saturated fat for an adult, let alone a kid. Um, so, okay, there's problems with this. But what happens if nutritionists independently develop nutrition criteria? And that experiment was done by Hannaford Supermarkets, uh, which those of you who live around here know about because they're all over the place here. H Hannaford, for reasons that I still don't understand, recruited a group of independent nutrition scientists to come up with rigorous nutritional criteria for evaluating products in the store. And the idea was that the foods that passed those criteria would be awarded one, two, or three gold stars. Um, and that consumers could come into the store and just grab the ones that had three stars and know that they were getting something really healthy. To their dismay, they discovered when they applied these rigorous criteria to 27,000 products, only 23% of the products in the store qualified for even one star. But that's not all. Of that 23%, 80% were fruits and vegetables in the produce section. <laughs> so what that tells you is that if you have reasonable nutrition criteria, very, very few processed foods get through the screen. Now, um, that's important because of what's happening in Great Britain, where um, there's been a move afoot to put traffic signals on food products. And I was in uh, Great Britain in August, and. Uh, I went to a Waitrose and I picked up this mozzarella and roast tomato wrap, which has um, two red lights, one yellow light, and one green light, and 500 calories, roughly. Uh, the idea here is you put a green light on products that are healthier, uh, the yellow ones are okay, and the red ones are a strong suggestion that you probably should leave it on the shelf. And in fact, that's what's happening. So the research shows that where the traffic light system is in place, consumers are not buying the ones with the red marks on them. That is why American food companies got together to come up with a different kind of labeling system <laughs> called Smart Choices. And the Smart Choices is interesting because it's a collaboration between a large number of major food companies and four nutrition organizations, or three nutrition organizations in the American Heart Association. Um, and I'm embarrassed to say that the American Society of Nutrition, which is an organization of nutrition researchers to which I belong, is managing this program. Um, and they, they set up their criteria. I thought the criteria were rather generous. You could have up to 25% of the calories from sugars and up to 480 milligrams of sodium per serving. Um, but even then, I didn't realize what was happening. And um, I was asked by a reporter for the New York Times to go to a supermarket with him. And the first product we spotted with a check mark was this one. Um, so here's Fruit Loops with a Smart Choices check mark on it. And it doesn't have 25% of the calories from sugar, it's got 44% of the calories from sugar because they make an exception for, uh, for cereals. So here we have a, um, a product with this check mark on it that's 40% of the weight of the product is sugar. Sugar is the first ingredient by weight. And this is the first of these check mark products. Now, this, of course, some, caused some um, hilarity in the press and the, re the <laughs> And the, this reporter, this, this reporter for the New York Times got, I understand that there are some students from Tufts here. Uh, this reporter got the dean of the School of Nutrition at Tufts to explain that Fruit Loops was a better choice of um, a breakfast than a donut. And the, you know, which, is, uh, one of the people on my blog said, maybe the program should be called Better Than a Donut. Um, and, the, um, 
And last week's economist had this wonderful picture of this child with a heading, it's practically spinach. Um, I mean, this is ludicrous um, and a source of great embarrassment. And you Tufts students, I want to hear about what's going on at Tufts. Um, so here's the, um, the environment that we live in where we have you know, government, industry, and sometimes health and nutrition professionals creating an environment that encourages people to eat more than they need or want. Okay, that's on the obesity side. Let me say just a few things about, oops, one more on this. Just to let you know, it's not, this is not just American. I was in Panama in January, and I picked up this, I mean, Kellogg's is right at the cutting edge. Um, this is, so here's chocolate sweetie cereals in Panama um, with an endorsement from the Pediatric Association of Guatemala. Um, so it, this is a worldwide phenomenon. Okay, let me say a few words about food safety. Food safety's changed in the United States from when um, it used to be a problem of uh, leftover Thanksgiving turkey and deviled eggs at church picnics. Uh, we're now dealing with the two most important food safety problems, I believe, which are food, food insecurity in the world, people not having enough to eat, and obesity and its consequences. But then we have these nasty microbes that we didn't used to have, uh, many of them antibiotic resistant. Uh, we have chemicals that nobody ever heard of before that are turning up in our food, like melamine. Um, and then these really weird animal diseases and uh, remedies for them with antibiotic resistance becoming increasingly important um, in these microbial illnesses. And in the United States, just within the last three years, we have had an extraordinary series of food outbra of outbreaks of E. coli or salmonella, and these are toxic forms of E. coli or salmonella. You don't want to get sick with either one of these. Um, the spinach E. coli episode of um, 2006, from which the spinach industry has never recovered. Sales of spinach in the United States have never reached since the levels that they were in 2005. The pet food recalls of 2007 um, that I thought were such an incredibly beautiful example of a food system gone awry that I wrote a book about it called Pet Food Politics. Um, the tomato recalls of 2008, except it wasn't tomatoes that caused the problem. It was jalapeno peppers, but in the meantime, the Florida tomato industry was completely destroyed. And then this year, we've had peanut butter pistachios, and most bizarrely, because nobody could figure out how the E. coli got in there, Nestle's Toll House cookies. I'm not related. Um, <laughs> so we, we have a, all of the, what you're, my conclusion from the pet food recall was that we only really have one food supply and the idea of separating the idea of that you have separate food supplies for animals, for pets, and for people makes no sense. We're all eating the same food and our food supply is global and that we're never going to have a reasonable food safety system unless we have a decent regulatory system and that regulation is essential. That's my take home lesson from all of that. Um, and we know what it is we need to do for food safety. We absolutely know there have been reports, people talking about it for years and years and years. We need one food safety agency. We need risk-based procedures. They have to be science-based. They have to be farm to table. And I would add to this that they need to be size specific so that the rules and the regulations are not necessarily the same for large and small producers. We need standards, we need regulations, we need education as part of all of that. We're not going to get any of that. It doesn't look like. Um, there's a lawyer in Seattle called Bill Marler who represents uh, victims of, of food safety outbreaks. And he has sent a t-shirt with this logo on it to every member of Congress in which he's asking them to, whoops, to pass a meaningful food safety legislation before Thanksgiving um, because he would like to see a decent food safety system. He, he's made enough money and he doesn't uh, want to see these people getting unnecessarily sick. My understanding is that Congress will not do this uh, before Thanksgiving. They're certainly not, they're not even considering a single food safety agency that combines USDA and FDA and the bill that's most likely to pass just fixes the FDA. That'll be a help. 
But the story that I hear is it won't happen before um, the healthcare stuff gets done, and we may be waiting a while for that. Um, one solution the onion put forward. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the onion had a very simple solution to the food safety crisis. The FDA should just say salmonella is okay, and we wouldn't have any problems. I love the onion. Um, now, I would be depressed about all this, except that I think we're in the middle of a food revolution, and it's really exciting to be in the middle of a food revolution. Here's what Alice Waters really looks like, if you want to, for those of you who weren't sure who that was in that painting in the gallery. Um, we're in the middle of a food revolution, and uh, you know, part of that food revolution is being fueled by Michael Pollan and his extraordinary work, and I particularly loved his letter to the farmer-in-chief in the New York Times Magazine last fall, in which he made three suggestions. Resolarize the American farm, he's talking about energy there. Re-regionalize the food system, put more emphasis on local and regional food, and rebuild America's food culture and teach people how to taste real food and how to appreciate real food. Um, it's, if you haven't read that piece, uh, it's as good as anything else he's ever written. So the, I'm teaching food sociology this semester, and uh, it's a course about food as a social movement. And it's like the civil rights movement and the women's movement and the environmental movement in a lot of ways. And in other ways, it's different. And one of the ways it's different in, is in the fragmentation. So we have the slow food revolution. But notice that these are in revolutionary terms. Um, food that's good, clean, and fair, good for health, clean for the environment, fair to the people who uh, are producing it, and slow meaning tasting good and being eaten and appreciated. Um, we have the healthy food movement. Um, a group in Oakland, California, the Strategic Alliance, did a survey of nutritionists and asked them what they thought healthful food really was. And the consensus was that, real, that healthy foods were minimally processed, contained only natural, not added nutrients, didn't have anything artificial added. If it was animals, they were raised without hormones or antibiotics. They were sustainably produced fair to the workers, and accessible and affordable to everybody. Seems like a good definition to me. I like it. Um, I live in New York City, where we have a really unusual thing going on. Um, we had a health director last year and the year before um, who was really interested in public health. Uh, um, this is real, and as a mayor who backs him up, this is astonishing. And when he left to become head of the Centers for Disease Control and and prevention, he was replaced by somebody who, if anything, is even more interested in public health than he was. So we got a lot going on in New York. And New York City requires calorie labeling of uh, fast foods that have more than 15 outlets, putting it in context of 2,000 calories a day. And for those of you who haven't seen it, it's worth a field trip. Um, I mean, it's just extraordinary to see the number of calories that are in these foods, and it's having two effects. One is it's encouraging people not to eat so much, and the other is it's encouraging the producers of these foods to cut down on the, either the size or the ingredients so that the calories are being cut down. So this may have an important effect. Um, they, their latest campaign is called Pouring on the Pounds, and um, it is an anti-soft drink campaign. As the evidence accumulates that soft drinks are, are tightly linked to rise in body weight, it's become clear that the first thing that you do when you want to advise people about controlling their weight is to get them to cut down on soft drinks and juice drinks. Um, the result of that campaign um, is that the Center for Consumer Freedom, which is a um, misnamed a public relations firm for the restaurant, alcohol, tobacco, and other kinds of industries started putting these big full-page ads in New York newspapers, you're too stupid to make your own choice about foods. These are very 
these uh, advertisements are targeted at personal responsibility, saying the big government has no right to tell you what to eat. You're an adult. You're an individual. You're responsible for what you eat. Don't pay any attention to this kind of advertising. My, you know, I mean, one of those big ads, full page in the New York Times, must be between eighty and a hundred thousand dollars. And my guess is the New York City's campaign must be having some effect. Um, so I see it as a hopeful sign. Part of the concern of the soft drink companies is that there's now a big push to start taxing them. And there was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the most prestigious medical journal um, by a whole bunch of people who signed on to it, that uh, both public health and the economy would benefit if sugar-sweetened beverages were starting to be taxed. So we'll see what happens to that. Um, we have the organic movement. Um, and here again, it's in revolutionary terms. And here it's quantitative, because you can count the money that is spent on organic food. It, ha it was up until uh, 2007, when the economic crisis started to hit, uh, booming in sales. And it's now leveled off a little bit, but people are still buying organic. And as more of these food safety things happen, people turn more to organics because they believe that organics are safer. Um, which I guess they are so far. Um, I do a lot of traveling, and I was in Fairbanks, Alaska this summer, actually for quite a long time. And the, um, I visited an organic farm in, outside of Fairbanks. I thought it would, that was amazing, because Fairbanks is 200 miles north of Oslo. If you, you know, count, it's really far north. Um, they have a growing season that's about five minutes long. And, <laughs> But they have a lot of light during that five minutes, and it kind of makes up for it. And the people who were on this organic farm were not native Fairbankers. They were people who came from all over the world to work on that farm during the summer as part of, an, as part of internships or whatever that woof thing is. Um, and so there they were. They were very, very happy campers for the summer. Um, part of the reason, part of the impetus for organics has to do with what's going on with genetically modified foods, which I know is a big issue at this conference. And this is the Department of Agriculture's latest figure on the adoption of genetically modified crops in the United States. Um, look at the numbers on the left-hand column, and you can see that between 60 to 90 percent of soybeans, cotton, corn, um, are genetically modified, and sugar beets are not on this list. But more than 90% of the sugar beets in the United States are genetically modified, all of which happened in the last three years. Um, we have an interesting situation in the United States where you have no way of knowing this unless you read the Department of Agriculture's website or are tuned into this issue because they're not labeled. And I was fascinated to be in the United Kingdom um, and to pick up this brochure at McDonald's and see that McDonald's is now telling its customers that it does not use any genetically modified food in any of its food products or in anything that it's serving. We know our consumers are concerned about um, genetically modified products or, ingre or ingredients, and we reassure you that we do not use any in any of our products. I thought that was absolutely amazing. Um, I also picked up a Reese's Nutrageous, Nutrageous uh, Hershey's cookie of candy bar, which has um, a label on it, contains genetically modified sugar, soy, and corn. If they can do that in England, we could do that here. It wouldn't be very hard to do. I'd like to see this stuff labeled. Um, Fairbanks also had a farmer's market. And here again, you can count. It's quantifiable. You can count the number of farmers markets in the United States and the increase over the last 10 years. And of course, the latest addition to that is um, what's happening at the White House, which I hope I'll show you in a minute. I also wanted to show you some things about um, locally grown food. I don't understand what McDonald's is doing in Great Britain. But these are McDonald's trucks. One of them says, our beef is reared on British and Irish farms, locally grown. Our eggs are all free range and laid in one place, locally, Britain. Um, so McDonald's has become this green entity. It's kind of weird. Um, 
locally grown in Fairbanks. There were the the, the Safeway advertised locally grown food. Um, I thought that was kind of amazing. And um, actually, at New York University, we have locally grown food. And I told some of you about this. We have a gardener. I had no idea. There's no land, as you can see here. This is outside the building where I work. Um, but he has 83 planter boxes. And these have beans in them. And he planted vegetables in all of the planter boxes that he could get his hands on this year, locally grown food. Uh, and also part of the new, the new growing your own food movement, which is huge these days. And so I want to mention about truck farm. Have, have many of you seen the film King Corn? Yes. Yeah, which I loved. Oh, well, these are the guys who made King Corn, and they're now making a movie called Truck Farm. Um, and by truck farm, they don't mean what you usually think of, where a truck delivers the stuff. They're growing vegetables on the back of a pickup truck in Brooklyn. <laughs> Um, and um, the lower right hand, the lower left hand picture here, I mean, here, actually, here they are. There's their truck, and here are the guys in front of my building in Manhattan, where um, what they did was they sold $20 shares in a CSA from their truck farm. I bought one. I thought it was going to be worth $20. And they delivered my CSA share to my door. And I, they just handed me. There they are cutting the vegetables and putting them into a bag for me. It was really fun. And it's on YouTube. I'm in episode two. <laughs> um, school gardens. I'm still in Fairbanks. I thought Fairbanks was amazing. Um, and so this is the school garden outside the middle school in Fairbanks, the most beautiful garden I ever saw. Um, and what they're trying to do is harvest the produce from this garden and then sell it at the farmer's market and raise money for school things. Seemed like a really good idea. The business about school meals is really important these days. And I can't talk enough about why I think schools matter. They set an example. They set standards. Um, there are places where kids are learning and um, learning about life. And there's lots of books about what to do about these. There's Ann Cooper's Lunch les Lessons. There's Janet Poppendieck's Free For All, which is a polemic about the need for universal school meals. It's coming out in January. And the most recent thing I've gotten is this uh, Student Gardens and Food Service online pamphlet from Bon Appetit Management Company in San Francisco, um, which is a manual about how to start a garden in a school and how to go all the way from, uh, pl from planting the garden, planting the garden, uh, growing the garden, harvesting the garden, and using the produce from that garden in the school lunch program. Very handy. A really nice thing to have, and it's online. So personal responsibility. Um, I think you eat food, not products. You eat smaller portions. You support local farmers when you grow. Grow food at home, cook at home, and teach co kids to cook. I do believe that the most radical thing that we could do about food would be to teach kids to cook. Um, on the social responsibility, I think we need to talk about policy. And this is my laundry list of whatever it was we were talking about during the World Cafe. Uh, this is my particular laundry list of policies that I'd like to see worked on. Um, better school food with universal school meals. I'd like to see restrictions on marketing to kids. I think we need a decent food safety system. We have to rethink the whole business about farm supports and tax policies. I'd like to see something done about income equity that would solve the problem of affordability. And then the big ones, campaign financing laws and corporate regulations that are the root of the corruption in our food system. Um, I think this is a really great time to change. We have a first lady and a first family who have planted an organic garden at the White House. Um, and the symbolic value of this, it's not changing the food system, but I think it has a powerful symbolic value. Um, there's a farmer's market across the street from the White House that was opened by the First Lady, a powerful symbolic value. And in fact, we've got <laughs> a new era in American agriculture. And I will stop here. Thank you very much.
point. Um, I'm really curious about uh, the, the slide that you had um, with New York City advertising. I wonder if we can pull that yeah. one up again. Um, and especially the counter arguments um, that were being published by the American, uh, by the, I don't know what it was called, the, the Center Consumer, Consumer Freedom. Freedom. That's the one. Um, I recommend a trip to their website. Okay. Um, they're a very, very interesting group, and why can't I find the thing that opens this up? Okay, I'll just do it that way. Um, they're a very interesting group, and there they are. Can you see that, or do I need to yeah, make yeah, it bigger? Yeah. Oh, I, um, I guess I just I read it on the, the, the right-hand side posted, and it didn't make any sense. Well, um, because what they, I mean, it just seems like what they're advocating is that you're too stupid, and I, I guess... Uh, well, you, know, you can't response? read the words that are underneath. I guess um, it was, uh, is it a direct response to the, the idea that they have um, labeling on the, on, on, um... I wonder if we can open it up over there. Um, let's see, you're too stupid, you're too stupid to make your own food choices. Um, at least according to the food police, that would be me, and government bureaucrats who have proposed fat taxes on foods they don't want you to eat. Now the trial lawyers are thundering into action lawsuits, class action lawsuits against restaurants for serving America's favorite foods and drinks. That's what it says. I guess it's just, um, so this is in direct response to the don't drink yourself fat, or is this in response yes. to the... Yes, and, the and the proposals for taxes. Okay. Yeah, the, this is a group that's paid for, well, actually, it's very interesting. It's, it's incorporated as a non-profit so that they don't have to re reveal their sources of income. But there have been lots and lots of investigative reports about them. And if you go on my website and click on Center for, my, my website is completely indexed. And if you click on Center for Consumer Freedom, it has links to all of the reports that have been done about them. They're an interesting, um, they're an interesting group. They represent the fish industry arguing that methylmercury doesn't, isn't a problem for people. They represent the tanning industry saying that tanning salons don't cause skin cancer. Um, I mean, they have all of those sort of consumer behavior uh, kinds of things. They, they represented the, um, the National Restaurant Association when there were proposals to stop smoking in restaurants. They defended smoking in restaurants, always on personal responsibility and personal freedom grounds. So they're an interesting group. Uh, but I think so discredited that I can't imagine that anybody pays any attention to them. Um, yes? Anybody else? Yes? There was a short slide about um, the traffic light system in the UK. And it sounded like you find it, you think it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah I like, like them. To know, because I'm, I'm very critical about, about that. We have a lot of discussions about it in Germany. And it's like, I mean, it's even good olive oil is dark red. Oh, yeah. And well, the issue is the good, yeah, it's a slippery slope. It's a, the whole business about rating foods. I mean, if I had my choice, we wouldn't have any labels about health or nutrition on food products at all, if it were up to me. We would just have food, right? Um, I don't know whether we're going back to that, but the, I see the Smart Choices program as an end run because we know that the traffic light system at least stops people from buying some things. Whether, you know, what the choices are and how the choices are made is something that we can argue about forever. I think it's a slippery slope. Where do you draw the line? The minute you say, you set up a standard, it can only have 480 milligrams of sodium. What if it's got 479? What's the difference? Right. Like sheep, I mean, they have this kind of substitute with, mm -hmm. with a lot of water in it. Yeah, it's margarine like, versus butter. That would be the, the margarine versus butter argument. I would agree completely. These, none of these systems is perfect. I don't like any of them, but if we have to have one, I prefer a traffic light. Yeah. 
you have any suggestions for moving forward on GMO labeling? I can't hear you. Uh, do you have any uh, suggestions for how to move forward on GMO labeling? On GMO labeling? I think you need a big consumer push on it. Um, and this is the time to do it. This is a chain, you know, the, the FDA hired Michael Taylor as um, the number two person uh, working with Margaret Hamburg at FDA on food safety issues. He's fabulous on food safety. Really, really good, I think. But he was the guy who was, who was the Monsanto graduate who was working at FDA um, during the time that the labeling decision was made. I mean, this is a chance for him to redeem himself, and I think he should be pushed really hard on it because the arguments that the FDA was using don't hold. They just don't hold. One of them was that uh, we don't label foods, the, we don't labeling, label processes on foods, but we do. We say orange juice is made from concentrate. That's a processing issue. So I don't, I, I don't think it works. And they said it couldn't be done. It can be done. If Hershey's candy bars can be labeled that they're genetically modified in Great Britain, they could be labeled here. You know, so give people a choice. I think the consumer choice argument is a very powerful one. Um, and that consumers ought to have a choice. Um, and for that, I think you need to lobby in the way that lobbying takes place. Uh, the more, the merrier. In the back. Hi, thank you. Um, I really appreciated the way that you sort of framed the whole talk as individual decisions and social decisions, sort of that framework. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the relationship between sort of social and political decisions and individual decisions in the food industry. <laughs> Yeah, I can't, I can't quite hear, but you want to, what the, you know, the, the relationship between social responsibility and individual responsibility, yeah. obviously you need both, obviously. But we live in a society in which the default choices, I, I think you have to talk about the default. What's the default? The default is to eat what's in front of you. If what's presented to you at a dinner is healthy, um, and you know, meets nutritional guidelines and does all of that, and then you're gonna eat it, like we did at dinner tonight, right? Um, if the default is to give you an enormous plate of something that hasn't been made very well and isn't very good quality and has far too much calories and all of the bad things, uh, then you're gonna eat that. And so the real question is, how do you make the default something healthy? And in particular, how do you make the default something healthy for people who don't have a lot of money? You've got a choice if you've got money. You can choose to go to a store and buy really nice vegetables and really nice whatever. If you're poor, you don't have that choice. You're buying cheap, the cheapest calories you can get. So how do you change that? That requires social responsibility. Um, so it isn't, I mean, it, we like to think that we have complete, unfettered, uninfluenced choice about what we eat, but we don't. We eat what's there. You know, our choices are defined by the environment. And, you know, I look around at what's available for me to eat at lunch and the place where I work, or what's in a vending machine, if there are vending machines around. Those are default choices. What kind of social responsibility would it take to that? Every kind of social responsibility. That list of policies that I had, the, the kinds of lists of policies that came out of the World Cafe are exactly those kinds of things. You know, you get, you get groups together to work on these kinds of issues to change the environment. And that's what you're trying to do here, is you're trying to make a more sustainable food supply. That's changing the environment to make it easier for people to eat more sustainably. You can't eat locally grown food if there isn't any. You know, I mean, that's, it, it, you can't, right? So you want to change land policy so people can grow food locally, and then you can eat locally grown food. Uh, I mean, I don't, uh, these are all political things, and they require social efforts. If you go into a school, you're changing, I mean, that's an easy example. You go into a school and change the school environment, you've already done something incredible for those kids, right? I went to, I was taken to schools in Manhattan last week, and I went into a school in Bedford-Stuyvesant, which is one of the poorest areas of Brooklyn. Um, 
And I walked into that school, it smelled good. Somebody was making something for lunch that smelled yummy. Um, and I went into the kitchen and the place was spotless. The place was set up, the cooks were in there, the food was gorgeous. It was absolutely gorgeous food. And I, it was jaw dropping. I mean, this is one of the poorest areas of Brooklyn. And I said to the school food service director, how did this happen? And she said, oh, she said, the staff here really cares. That's all you need. There was a principal who cared. They had a CSA at the school. They raised money so that people in the neighborhood that couldn't afford to join the CSA could get memberships. They raised money, so this was a uniform school. The kids wore white blouses and black pants or skirts. They raised money so that the parents who couldn't afford it could get clothes for their kids. There was a garden at the school. These were poor neighborhood kids. It doesn't get any poorer than that. I went to a high school nearby. Um, same food, didn't smell good, didn't taste good, didn't look good, the kids weren't eating it. Um, what's the difference? Nobody cared. The vending machines were open during lunch, totally illegal. I was there with people from the uh, school department. Nobody said anything. The vending machines were open during lunch. Illegal. I was, you know, nobody cared. So all you have to do to change a school is have somebody there who cares. That's not that hard to do most of the time. Sometimes it's hard. But there are a lot of people in schools who care. Lots. Um, yeah. Uh, could you talk about the effects of the like, genetically modified crops or the latest findings on that? <coughs> you know, I can't hear at all. The effects on, of genetically modified foods on what? Um, just the, the most recent findings because I can't hear it. Can somebody yeah, scream? Can I'm you? I'm curious to hear about the most recent findings on genetically modified crops because I sense that even if food labeling um, contain that type of information that most consumers would not know what to do with it. Um, what, the latest information on what about them? On the effects? I'm not aware of any effects on people's health. I know of a lot of effects on economy, on farmers, on, on land use, on growth of crops in developing countries. I don't know of any effects on health. Yeah? don't know about the effects of genetically modified foods is because they're so well suppressed. If you've seen um, Deborah Coons Garcia's film. I have. Yeah. And she talks about the scientist whose name escapes me, who was doing the research on GM in Scotland. And, um, and when he discovered that there were very severe effects on, on the, the test animals, um, he was effectively silenced. He tried very hard not to be. But his, you know, his materials were stolen. His, he was all kinds of things happened. Pushtai, his name was Pushtai. Right. Um, but also, I think people have default beliefs as well as as default food choices, and one way to get through to them is to show them the connection between them and, you know. So, so one thing that the Park Slope Food Co-op did, which you probably are aware of, is a as in, you live in New York City? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is to, to do, I feel like I'm taking too much time. Well, you know. But um, they fine. formed a very solid committee, started, decided to keep it to making labeling of genetically modified foods a choice rather than try to take the whole huge mm -hmm. mass of things that you could get into. Started with the co-op itself. We have 11,000 members in the mm -hmm. co-op, so it's a pretty pretty good selection of population and also it's very diverse. And some of the people in Bed-Stuy are also members of the, the food co-op. Um, checked and, and labeled everything in the co-op itself for those 11,000 people who shop there. So they would know that anything that did not say it's certified organic that has soybeans in it, including lecithin or any fraction of soybeans, you know, corn syrup, whatever, or corn. Um, was probably genetically modified and then distributed what information there was mm -hmm. about what the effects might be, what, you know, that there are changes, there are organic, uh, there are physiological changes that happen in rats 
and probably are happening in, well. Yeah. I've read those papers, sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think there are plenty of reasons to be, there are plenty of reasons to be concerned about genetically modified foods and that they need to be labeled. And I would push really hard on it. So. land-based foods, and I wonder what your thoughts are about food that comes from the sea. Yeah, in my book, What to Eat, um, I have five chapters on fish. Um, what, what, I, what to Eat is um, a book about food issues, situated in supermarkets as an organizing device. And it was, those were probably the hardest five chapters that I had to write. Um, I was astounded at the number of issues around fish um, and, you know, just was overwhelmed by the task of trying to deal with them and I divided it up into five chapters and dealt with those issues there. I don't even, I think the big shock to me when I was writing those chapters was that there isn't a single waterway in America where you can eat the fish uh, without worrying about how often you're eating them. And, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't know that before I started working on that book, so I'm guessing that lots of people didn't know that, I would guess. Um, and that's uh, the idea that companies have been allowed to pollute waterways to the extent that the, that and sewage systems have been allowed to pollute waterways to the extent that they have, so that fish have accumulated all of these toxins, is just shocking to me. And I use the mercury example as uh, when I'm teaching public health as the, it's very hard for <clears throat> students often to understand why social responsibility matters um, <clears throat> when you're talking about public health, when really public health is about individual behavioral choices. And I use methylmercury as the example because um, if you want to reduce the amount of methylmercury in, in fish, um, you have two choices. You can tell pregnant women not to eat predatory fish, or you can cut off emissions from coal-burning power plants, which is as, as remote from the supermarket as anything that I can think of. So that's the best example I can think of, of why social responsibility is so important. No.